Hello and welcome to this special edition of Creator Talks. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. My regular weekly podcast will be out this Thursday with guests Pornsack, Pintachot, and Aaron Campbell to talk about Infidel. I'm bringing you this special edition because there is time-sensitive information of great importance. My guests this episode are J.H. Williams III and Wendy Wright Williams. They are joining me on this show to talk about their upcoming anthology, Where We Live. This book is being put together with professional creators, artists, writers, and local artists and writers from Las Vegas to help support victims and their families of the senseless shootings on October 1st, 2017. The book is being published by Image Comics with a huge list of creators too long to even mention. Well-known names that we will talk about on the show. The book is 1999. It comes out May 30th in comic book stores and June 5th in bookstores everywhere. I'm bringing this to you now because the final order cutoff is April 16th. 100% of the book's proceeds will go to the GoFundMe campaign for the survivors. For those of you who don't know who J.H. Williams III is, he worked on Batman, Starman, Justice Riders, his own project Chase, and of course the Greg Rucker run of Batwoman Elegy, including illustrated The Sandman Overture by Neil Gaiman. We're going to talk about the benefit, the book, the need for greater gun control, and also to go through my rest and relaxation questions with J.H. and Wendy so we get to learn a little bit more about them. So let's join my conversation with them in Las Vegas, here now on Creator Talks. J.H. Williams III and Wendy Wright Williams, welcome to Creator Talks. Hello. Hello. Before we get started, I just want to say I jumped aboard back when you did Batwoman, when the New 52 series kicked off, Hayden Blackman was writing the book at the time. I actually got a trade of the series, took it with me on my trip to Las Vegas, and read it there. I remember where I read books. You know, if it's someplace significant, if it was a happy time, I say, oh, I was here when I read that book. And I was in a hotel with my family, and they were sleeping in another room. And I, in the morning, I would get up and I would read the trade. So, uh, love that, and did a great job on the series. And I found something else recently. Uh, tell me about this. You just did a motion illustrated Kindle version of Dracula? Yes. And on the Batwoman stuff, Hayden and I both co wrote that, but I was only the artist on the Greg Rucka run for Batwoman. I wasn't acting as writer at that point. But the Dracula book is, uh, yeah, I definitely recently did that. Well, kind of recently. It took them a while to release it. That was 50 paintings I did for that. That was a pretty cool project to do. I have a copy. And I'll be going traveling soon, and that is going on my iPad. And any other trades I haven't read yet, because <laughs> I have to pack light. So um, <laughs> I'll be catching up that way. Let's talk a bit about where you are right now, both of you. Uh, you moved to Las Vegas just a few years ago. Why did you move to Vegas? Uh, we were actually in Central California. It's much warmer there, so it's not that different. <laughs> We've been coming to Vegas for 20-some years, and... But most of our close friends live out here. Got to where we were coming out three times a year. And the area that we were in was very rural and, and small town. And, you know, we're night people. So having a 24-hour city is kind of cool. And the cost of living was cheap. We figured, why not? And we actually had meant to move out probably 10 years ago. But with the housing bubble, uh, our house was it worth anything? And <laughs> we had to wait until that recovered fully. And so then we came out here a couple of years ago and, and we're really happy. It was a bit of a you know double-edged sword decision because we have close friends that live where we used to live as well. So that made it tough. For me personally, I kind of have lived all over the place in various times of my life. So the idea of moving to another location was didn't affect me so much, and that was exciting. But for Wendy, you know, where we used to live, she grew up there. Us moving here was a really big decision for her. But like I said, we, you know, we ended up having to leave some other friends from where we live, we used to live, but they come and visit. Vegas is a good place to visit. So. Right, right. <laughs> right. You can easily entertain, so it's not like 
forcing anyone to come. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's easy to get there too. There's plenty of flights to get there, direct flights. So it's not like you have to take a, yep. a flight to Montana or something like that where it's very expensive. Right. I've been out there several times with my wife and family, uh, you know, at least I forget how many times now over the past 10 years. It's about once a year I go out there. And you answered some oh, of the yeah, cool. questions I had next was like, well, what about the heat? And, you know, because like, people have heard me on the podcast and friends have heard me say, you know, someday I just might live out there. And my wife's like, it's too hot. And I'm like, but it's dry. And oh, scorpions. Right. I'm like, I've yeah. never seen a scorpion. It's just moving away from family is the biggest problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The heat is my favorite thing. But it is different. I mean, where we used to be, it would get very hot in the summer, but it much higher humidity. And then you just feel like you're in a sauna. Here, it is very, very dry. The only real difference is it doesn't cool off as much at night. So you're just going to have the air conditioner on. <laughs> and you have to drink a lot more water because it's so dry. Water. Yeah, because it's so dry. I could live with that because here, I'm in the mid-Atlantic states, it gets swampy in the summer. Not as bad as the south, but still it gets kind of smelly and sticky and uh, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, I'd much rather have the dry heat personally. <laughs> yeah, and, and we have yet to see a single scorpion. Yeah. So some friends of ours here have had run-ins with them on occasion, but it's not as prolific as you would think. And actually, one of the things I noticed here versus where we used to live, even way less spiders yeah. in general. Yeah, well, um, bugs in general. I mean, if you're bug phobic, this is the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot to, that you have to contend with so much. Yeah. Some parts of the area have fire ants. Pretty. I haven't. Yeah. You know, I think when we were first house hunting years ago, one of the houses we looked at had fire ants in the backyard, but we haven't seen any in the location we're at. So. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, we have a little bit of silverfish, a little bit of earwigs, you know. The typical stuff, but yeah. But barely. Where we used to live, we would be overwhelmed with something or other. Yeah. So it's really nice for, you know, if you're bug folks. <laughs> yeah. I want to get to the Benefit comic, Where We Live. It's a great thing that you're doing. And this all came out of the events October 1st, 2017 on the Las Vegas Strip. It was the Route 91 Harvest Country Music Festival where a gunman, who I will not name on the show, I never want to mention the name of a mass murderer killer, they fired into the crowd from one of the floors of Mandalay Bay. So we had like 58 people killed and over 500 injured. And please share with me what happened that evening. You, J.H., you were just laying back and checking your Twitter feed. And what happened? We were still in California for our friend's wedding, and it was that night. We had just gotten back from visiting with some friends during the day, and we got back to our hotel in the middle of the evening. As you do, you know, if you're on Twitter, you randomly check Twitter, and as soon as I went on there, the first post was from Tess Fowler that I saw, and she was talking about that there was a shooter, uh, active shooter in Las Vegas, and first thing I said is, like, is this a joke? Because... You know, we all know that these things have been occurring in different communities around the country. When you see it's your own, the first reaction is you don't believe it. You think it can't be real. And within seconds, of course, I'm telling Wendy there's an active shooter and we're turning on the TV and looking at the news. It became horrifyingly real within a minute. And we have several friends that work on the strip. And so it was immediately... <laughs> We started texting people like, are you working tonight? Are you safe? And one of our closest friends was working. Uh, she actually lives across the street from us, and she was on lockdown. And at that time, there was so much chaos and so much rumor flying around. People are panicked because they've never been locked down in a hotel before. We managed to get her on the phone and trying to keep her calm. She's telling us all these things that like people are saying like you know that the shooters in their building that there are bombs all over the strip bomb threats yeah. yeah and there's multiple shooters stuff like that and you know and she's hearing from her friends that are some of them were actually working that festival and they're telling her they've never seen so many dead bodies and you know we're, we have the news on so we're trying to inform her as much as we can with what we could see from the outside just try to keep her calm she's asking me Am I going to be okay? And I have to tell her, yeah, you're going to be okay. And we really didn't know. Nobody knew what was going on at the time. Yeah. You know, all I could hope for is that, you know, because SWAT came in and locked down the building, that 
they were relatively safe. Yeah, and the woman we're speaking about, she's like family to us, and she's like our sister. And Wendy is telling her that she wishes we could be there, and she's telling us she doesn't want us there because it's not safe there. And she's terrified, of course, and there's high level of emotion. Feeling of helplessness. A feeling of helplessness on everyone's part and that conversation lasted a while but of course eventually she has to get off the phone and try to call other people she needs to speak to other people because she wants to tell them she loves them and i cannot begin to describe how difficult that was or what that felt like i speak about it a little bit in the essay that i wrote for the image plus magazine when we first talked about starting this project and having to hang up the phone with someone that you love dearly, not knowing if they're actually going to be okay, and you're having to believe that they will be, but you just don't know, and you have to hang up that phone. I can't begin to explain how difficult that was, how heavy that was, and we yeah, couldn't be there. We couldn't be there. It's, you know, we're in a whole other state. The feeling of helplessness, I mean, you, of course, want to run and help your family or your friends, and that you can't. It's not a feeling I've felt before. By the time we got off the phone with her, um, I think it was two or three in the morning as she's needing to reach out to other people or other people are trying to reach her. That's tough. And then you hang up the phone and you have to sit with that. Our first instinct was to just hop in the car and go home. We had driven, but, you know, it's an eight-hour drive in the middle of the night. There was other people we had committed to see in Merced the next day who we hadn't seen in two years. We just needed to sleep and see those people and then get home. And then once we got home, we're checking in with everyone. The week passes by and we're doing what we can do, paying attention to the news and what's going on, trying to get some sort of work done. But by that Friday, I think it was that Friday, Thursday or Friday night in the middle of the night, I just kept thinking about that. I wasn't seeing someone say, hey, we're going to do something to try to help the victims you know, as the comics industry has done in the past. You've seen those sorts of benefit books or projects in the past. And so in the middle of the night, I was just like, how do you even do this? I don't even know how you do this. And I just started randomly tweeting about it. And then by the next morning, you know, I had some people reaching out to me. I think the first person that reached out to me was a letterer, actually, by the name of Bernardo Bryce. And he's done a significant amount of work on the book, actually. Yeah, he's been a real trooper. And that's sort of how we got started doing it. It was sort of spurred out of emotion of trying to feel like, is there something we can do uniquely that is creatively that we know how to do to help people? And that's where it kind of all started. And when people started reaching out to us, at that point, I hadn't even spoken to Wendy about what I had said on Twitter. And then as people started reaching out, we both kind of were like, okay, I guess this is what we're going to do. And then we quickly made a decision that it's great that people do these pin-up books and their heart's in the right place. And of course it helps people, but we wanted to do a little more than just raise money. We wanted to actually do something meaningful. Or try to. Or try to. With the amount of pain the community was in, we couldn't do something superficial. We had to do something that was meaningful and that honored them and maybe addressed this problem that this country is experiencing. We quickly decided that we wanted to do stories instead and try to start a conversation. We don't seem to be able to have a civil conversation around this issue. And we wanted to have a conversation and by no means do we claim to have any of the answers. But we need to have the conversation. We can't continue on this path. That's clearly been demonstrated by the number of shootings since and the lack of action. I don't understand this thinking of we're supposed to be the greatest country on earth, and yet we are helpless to this situation. Well, it's a problem that's been escalating. And just as of this recording yesterday, there was a shooting at the uh, YouTube building. I mean, it's like every week there's something. It's every week, not a mass shooting, but... There's something pretty much everywhere. One of the things that a lot of people are not aware of and we're not aware of for 2017, the news can only keep up with the shooting cycle so much. And it almost seems like if it's not a mass shooting that reaches a certain number of people killed or wounded, it just doesn't get the coverage. 
But one of the statistics of last year is that there was nearly 350 considered mass shootings in America last year. That's one for almost every day. And a lot of people don't realize the extent that this has actually been going on. For 2018, I don't know what the number is, but you know the news seems to be reporting on, like you said, one almost every week. But I'm sure there's others that are not getting the coverage. Well, I mean, the, just the sheer amount, they're not able to cover all of them, yeah. which is really pathetic. It's not the media's fault. It's our fault for right. allowing but this to happen. The problem is much more severe and prevalent than a lot of people even realize. Yeah, never mind the suicides and everything else. We just wanted to do something that humanized these people. That's the other thing that we bring home is that, like I said, we have lots of friends that work on this trip and they had to go into work. Can you imagine this? The very next day, they're driving by blood-soaked streets to get to work and still have to serve. And it's a hospitality community. It's a hospitality so, community. That's how the city runs. So they're having to go in really shell-shocked. Some of them had had friends there. A lot of them are serving media. We have some that work at the very high-end restaurants, and they're serving people that you see on TV. The casual manner. And, you know, you can't really blame them because they've been in all kinds of different situations or whatever. But sort of the casual manner in which they speak about the situation and this person that's serving them lives here, and it seems so callous. They don't think about that there's humans that live here that are behind all those statistics and that have to deal with the repercussions of these events. That's partially what led to you know some of the thinking behind titling the book what we did. And Wendy aptly named the book and realized deeper meaning other than just this is the town we live. It's about where we live psychically in our hearts and minds. One of our goals, like when he was saying, is to humanize the issue, taking it beyond what you see on the news with statistics, have the creators involved in the book speak to that from their hearts. Well, how do they think about it? How has this affected them? Not just about Las Vegas affecting them, but the issue in general affecting them. Because in a lot of ways, these incidences are like spider webs. They just branch out across the country and you'd be amazed at how, how far it goes. With the book, we didn't want to stifle creativity. The only thing that we mandated, we've kind of put out a mission statement to all the creators. And we just asked that none of the responses be knee-jerk reactions, that we wanted something more thoughtful. I mean, there's a million opinions out there. I mean, you know, I grew up on a farm and we had guns. I grew up with guns. But we didn't have like AR-15s. We had guns for hunting or we had one pistol for protection and rarely came out. I'm not anti-gun. I've been around guns. You know, in my personal opinion, we can do better than the laws that we have now. I have a hard time understanding guns that are built to mow people down. They're weapons of war. On a range where they can't leave the range, I'd be a little more open to that. But just in general, I have a hard time understanding. We know that there's a million opinions out there, and we didn't assume what anyone's opinion was. We just asked that if you're going to speak about it, speak about it thoughtfully. And also, if you're going to cite facts that you... Put annotations. Yeah. You're not just pulling them out of thin air. That was basically it. And then we put out subjects that we would like covered, but gave the creators the choice of what they wanted. And how they wanted to tell. We have stuff about people's personal experience with guns, like in their family's opinion about gun laws. We have stuff about mental illness. We have stuff about loss. And we have a wide variety of ways that that's being expressed. We, you know, we have sequential art. We have poetry. We have journalists doing sequential art. All kinds of different ways that people are expressing themselves. The other thing that we've tried to do is involve as many locals as possible. We can get in touch with yeah. Right. We have local writers, we have local artists working with the names in our industry and the witnesses, of course. We have witnesses that we interviewed and they ended up working with writers to create uh, sequential art, tell their little part of the story. It's got quite a variety. It had requests for like pieces of art and it's been very difficult because everything is so varied. There's a million styles in there. Yeah. And, other interviewers, you know, wanted some samples. They want to know what the book is like. And I'm like, ah, that's impossible to convey in a handful of images. You know, like she's saying, it's quite varied and stylistically all over the place, which that should be expected from a book this size for an anthology. And, I, and honestly, I think for anthologies to be successful or a good anthology, they kind of need to be 
a mixed tape of various perspectives. And there's even allegorical content in here. I mean, most of the book is reality-based or slice-of-life-based or personal perspective-based, but there's a few allegorical pieces that have an underlying message or theme within them. So there's even some of that in there. I've never seen anything like this done before where you have both professional creators, local creators, stories from eyewitnesses firsthand, and then the creator's own experiences with guns. And I do like the way you're both laying this out there, that you're not really taking an extreme position either way. I mean, I know we can't ban all guns. You know, just like the creation of the A-bomb, how do you take that back? The knowledge is out there. You can't. But we can certainly control things better than we are because of the way it's just escalated. And, you know, there are things we can do, certainly. You know, we need to change some laws, licenses, training. And the idea of, like, well, you have to stop people that are mentally ill from getting guns some of these people there's no way to know this is going to happen so having bump stocks automatic weapons there's just no need for that for the average gun enthusiast who's responsible you know i mean there are responsible gun owners but there's no easy answer but i think with these stories it'll get people thinking and talking and like you said hopefully talking to each other and taking some action rather than talking past each other. Right. You know, because comics is a uniquely creative art form, sometimes dissemination of information, ideas can be received in more profound ways through story and art. And that's all we're kind of hoping for. The book ends up at the end leaning one direction or another that's purely from the tide of creators saying what they want to say. Yeah, and that's yeah. just the way it is. One of the things... We saw recently from a guy who studies how change happens in society. I thought this was rather interesting. And we saw this after we started working on this book, is that most of the time societies change not from presenting statistics and facts, but rather through story and people absorbing information in that way. So if this book in some small way can kind of contribute to moving the conversation forward to solving what needs to be solved, then it was worth all of it and all the time and energy it's taken to put this thing together. And this book, it's going to be over 300 pages and it's just 1999 and all the funds, the proceeds are going to go to a GoFundMe campaign for the survivors. Correct. Yeah. We had a little moment of panic when they closed the GoFundMe, but we have since been in contact with the people running that. And they're continuing to take some donations. Uh, and, mean, yeah. yeah, so we've made arrangements to get our money where it's supposed to go because the amount of need is so huge. It's going to be ongoing, I think, for a lot of these folks because, you know, over 500 people are injured, not counting the people who were witnesses to the event, the psychological impact on them and how long they're going to be dealing with that. I mean, the cost is going to be, I don't know if it's really measurable at this point. So if this book can raise some portion of funds to help some of these people, that's ultimately what we are after. And I'm sure whatever funds we raise, there's still going to be need beyond that. Oh, absolutely. So we're just trying to do whatever we could. And, and I wish that we could have gotten it out quicker, but just the sheer amount of work and effort that it has been, I don't see how we could have gotten it out any quicker without losing the goal of what we were trying to accomplish yeah. beyond the money. And the timing was terrible for trying to put together an anthology because of the, yeah, the, holidays. the holidays and stuff. And when you're dealing with a large number of creators, everyone's got their own other deadlines they have to worry about and yeah. their own lives to lead and all that stuff. It's a daunting task and a lot of work. We could have gotten it out sooner. The only thing that we maybe could have done was do an advanced solicit and then the book gets in your hands when it gets in your hands. But if we had done that, there's a good chance we would not have been able to give any indication of who's going to be in the book, what the size of the book would be, because all that was still formulating last month with the solicitation that we did come out with, the page count is incorrect. It's short versus what we're actually going to have. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we literally had someone out of the blue turn something in last week didn't realize that the project was going on and then turn something in. And yeah, it just kind of kept expanding. Yeah. Image has been really great about that too, because, you know, when we first approached Eric Stevenson about doing this, you know, one of the first questions we had for him was, do we decide on a page count 
up front and he was kind of like no let's wait and see what we get in and that was really impressive because he sort of was like let's see what this thing can be first and they have been amazing i mean yeah whatever we needed it was always a yes i'm like well we're getting you know when we're above 200 pages i'm like well we're getting over 200 pages now and he was like okay okay because we have locals talking about the issue and what it meant to them and eyewitness accounts one of the things we were concerned about is how do we delineate those pieces from the rest of the content that might be more fictional or outside of the Las Vegas area. Um, when I was talking to the editor, Will Dennis, he sort of came up with this idea. He's like, well, what if we create a design page that sits in the front and back of each one of those individual stories? And I just thought that was a brilliant idea, but that also means adding pages to the printing. And so when I talked to Eric Stevens and I said, look, it's going to be like 30 additional pages to accommodate giving each of those stories their own weight and space. And he was like, yeah, whatever. That sounds great. That's a great idea because <laughs> he could immediately see how that would make each one of those kind of have their own respectful place in the book. I mean, that's how accommodating image has been. I can't speak more highly about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Would you share some of the creators that are on the book? I've seen a huge list of people that are working on it. Neil Gaiman and Brian Bendis, Michael Oming, Phil Hester, James Robinson, Derek Robertson, J.M. DeMattis has written a story that every time I read it, I cry. I mean, it's so powerful. But then, you know, we have local contributors, this guy named Josh Ellis, who has written for magazines and has kind of a web presence as a commentator, I guess you could say, has written a fantastic essay. We have an essay from a local newspaper journalist named Rachel Crosby. There's so many creators, it's hard to name them right off the top of my head. And I don't want anyone to feel they're being slighted or lesser than anyone that's being mentioned because they are not. Uh, Kurt Busick did a pretty amazing allegorical story. Artist Andrew McLean drew that. It was fantastic. From, well, everyone on the book, amazingly talented people. Yeah. Was, that's the biggest thing I want to convey. Yeah. The book mapping yesterday. Is just, we, we, uh, we were ridiculous. It's hard with an anthology and all these different artistic feelings and expressions different points of view coming across to try to make that flow. So we're trying to do the book mapping yesterday and we're like reading these stories. We've read already three or four times. We're boohooing over here. <laughs> and it's like, damn it, we got to get through this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's emotionally difficult. It, yeah, it's been emotionally daunting. And I hope, I hope that, you know, when people read the book, that they get out of it what I'm getting out of it. I mean, it's very personal to us, being that we live here and that we've tried to help our friends get through what happened. And so it's very personal to us. You know, of course, it's going to impact us. But I only hope that a little bit of that comes across and affects people. I just want to reiterate, trying to call out specific creators involved in the book. It's difficult because I don't want any single one of them to feel like their contribution was lesser than the contribution sitting next to them. Yes. Because everyone involved in the book who decided to participate has turned in extremely profound work in one form or another. Yeah, we have been really impressed. No one's phoning it in. I'm so grateful and for so, the time they took. And in such a, you know, such a wide variety of perspectives and styles. I mean, just the artistic creativity involved is so... Um, wide ranging. And again, I think that will help make as far as a reading experience for an anthology work, because it's not all one note, even though it's all dealing with a heavy subject. Some people took not necessarily a humorous approach, but a lighter approach on how people communicate to someone turning in a really heavy, emotionally driven poem to a slice of life story about what they experienced growing up with guns in their life. I mean, it's just so wide ranging and presented in such diverse ways. And that's one thing I'm really proud of is being a comic book wife, trying to speak to people that don't know the industry. They think it's all superheroes. And I'm so proud to show in this book what comics can do. There's so much diversity in comics. 
and there's such a unique way of telling a story in comics. This book is a demonstration of how powerful comics can be. And how much variety it can have, you know, especially when you take in consideration some of the allegorical content. That's when you get into some unusual visual themes Mm -hmm. for something like this, which at first you have to think about, oh, well, that's surprisingly different. Brian Haberlin did this science fiction thing, but the underlying theme is speaking to an important message, and that's what is key. And sometimes it's good to have a piece like that mixed into the more, I don't know, realistic, real-life approach to maybe some of the content. I know, and hopefully the way that it reads, you're moving in and out of stories, and so hopefully it keeps people's interest. I mean, it's such a heavy subject. You can put it down and pick it up and get something new out of it. We're hoping that particularly with the kids in Parkland, that this book becomes irrelevant. Yeah, it becomes a message of not to go backwards. Yeah, at the very least, it's a message not to go backwards and that it will have a shelf life because of what it's covering. How it was handled. Yeah. And it's coming out May 30th in comic shops? Yeah, May 30th is the release date. I know it's also being offered through bookstores like Barnes and Noble and Amazon uh, Amazon is offering it. I don't know if their release date is the same or not. Yeah, June 5th, it's usually about a week after the comic shops. I see. Hopefully people can get a hold of it easily. I think there's even going to be a digital version available, if I'm not mistaken. If they want to find it, they can find it. The Where We Live Twitter account, we have information of the order number that you can use at the comic shop. I believe the cutoff for pre-orders is the 16th. Yeah, for retailers, FOC, final uh, order cutoff is April 16th is what we've been told. That means any of your listeners can go and view this as something they want to read. They can literally go into their comic store and say, hey, I I want this. Can you get it for me? Mm -hmm. And I will put the diamond code in the show notes as well. So People don't have to write it down now, but I will put it in there so when they listen to the podcast, they can just click on the show notes and they'll see that diamond code to give to their retailer. Awesome. Thank you. All the proceeds go towards the survivors. So I would suggest everyone pick up a copy and also pick up a copy for a friend, maybe who needs to see the discussion about all of this and maybe who hasn't read comics and can see the power of what comics can do. And let's show what the power of comics can do by supporting this and supporting our brothers and sisters who have been injured emotionally and physically in this horrible tragedy. Yes. Amen. If you have time, we can go over the fun questions I ask all my guests. Sure. Sure. I don't have an easy way to transition out of the book other than (laughs) the great thing about it is people coming together to do something, do something positive. So my first question, what do you like to do for rest and relaxation? We have TV junkies. We have too much good television these days. Between that, well, and then we're both vinyl collectors as well, and so that's also a problem. We listen to a lot of music. Primarily, though, when we're actually working, except for when we've been working on on this project, that's kind of felt like psychically while working on this stuff, I just, I can't, I can't listen to anything. I needed to be in a different headspace, I guess. Normally, we tweet about it, but it's been a little sparse the last six months. Uh, Yeah, we're TV junkies for sure. Or we go to concerts and stuff for audio files. We try to go for a good walk every day. Yes, we try. (laughs) Um, We happen to live next to a mountain, and so... We try to lug our butts up the hill every day. (laughs) Now think back to a birthday, both of you, that stands out in your memory. Why does that birthday stand out? Was it a person, a gift, a place you were? What was so special about it? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Oh, you're starting with that one. Oh, no, you don't. I didn't think about the last one because you got me this painting that I wanted so badly. Right. It was her 25th anniversary recently, and we let her road trip to Santa Fe and fell in love and spent way too much money on art. But still, there was a painting there that I completely fell in love with, but it was just towards the end of the trip, and we'd already spent so much money. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but he ended up getting it for my birthday. I don't know how he managed to surprise me with that. It's hard to surprise her. <laughs> well, because I do all the accounting. <laughs> That was pretty amazing. Um, I'd say for me, my favorite, more than one, it's the times where we would go for a drive up into the mountains, just a nice quiet day. Yeah. For a drive. That's probably my favorite thing. Yeah. We we used to live near Yosemite. That was something that we would do. We try to make a big deal out of birthdays because it's an excuse to get together with friends. Right. That's always a plus having a group dinner with all of our friends. Now think back. 
Each of you, when you were growing up, what posters or pictures did you have in your room? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, I'm a huge Blondie fan, so I definitely had Blondie poster. Actually, one of them is still in my office. I'm looking at it right now. And then I remember vaguely having these weird felt black light posters that you would <laughs> of course it that you would color with you would uh, <laughs> you would hang color with these fluorescent markers. It's like color by numbers in a way, but all the black parts of the artwork was like this weird felt like texture and you yeah. you filled in the white spaces in between with fluorescent markers. I remember that. How about you? Oh well well I was kind of born a goth kid <laughs> Uh, or or punk or, or metal head. I mean, it was I was always like in the punk bands and metal bands and goth stuff. Even when I was little, if there was like a Dracula thing or something like that, I would snatch it up and stick it on the wall. And I always loved horror movies. And it was the Saturday creature feature thing on the local channel. Is like I was glued to the TV. So I always had like horror stuff. <laughs> Even when I was really little. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and when, yeah, when I was a teenager, it was like metal posters and Sisters of Mercy posters and, and <laughs> <laughs> plasmatics, probably. Plasmatics, yeah. Wow, there's like a whole other show here. <laughs> 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 oh, I could go on with some of those. Hey, also back in your room back then, and we're about the same age, so I can say, what was on your turntable? What were you listening to at the time? For me, it was definitely Blondie Records, old foreigner records. <laughs> Blondie primarily, Blondie was the first band I ever spent my own money on buying a record from. And I was obsessed with them. Still am, really. So definitely that. Yeah, I always had kind of a diverse taste in listening to music because my brother and sister are 10 and 12 years older. And then, you know, my parents were older when they had me. And so I was kind of always listening to all kinds of music. First albums that I bought with my own money were the Plasmatic and Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin I listened to a lot as a kid, but then I had like Billy Holiday stuff. At that time I was really into Bing Crosby for some reason. I think because I watched a lot of old movies. We both love David Bowie. Yeah, David Bowie, of course. Oh, excellent, excellent. Of course it's going to be David Bowie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I always listen to stuff like that. The kind of the pop stuff that kids my age would listen to I never really got into as I got a little bit older I moved I still was into Blondie and David Bowie and stuff like that but I moved into much darker sounding stuff and a little bit of punk stuff like I really got into The Damned and yeah. Sisters of Mercy forget about it I, Sisters of Mercy and Fields of the Nephilim for me changed my life really well honestly we got together because of Sisters of Mercy and The Damned correct yeah <laughs> Yeah, I had Sisters of Mercy posters that he didn't have. Yeah, so you know I had immediate street cred. And I became so obsessed with the Sisters of Mercy that I literally went down the rabbit hole and got into all the offshoot bands. Oh no! If there was like a session player, he would find out like if they had an album somewhere else in Germany, and <laughs> you know get that. In fact, our wedding, we walked down the aisle to the Damned. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> sort of uh, brought us together. Yeah. <laughs> I listened to a bunch of stuff. I listened to Bowie and Zeppelin, but the first album that I bought with my own money, and I think it was less than $6, and it was a two-album set, was the FM movie soundtrack. Steely Dan, oh. Linda Rostat, Boston. I think Farner was on it. Yeah, I just that was the first thing I bought. Very top 40, but, you know, I still have it. I still have the album. <laughs> That's awesome. That's classic. Yeah. Classic in a good way. Yes, very much. <laughs> now, this question. Of all the books you have, if you were stuck on a deserted island, what is the one book that you would want to have with you? Ooh. Um, I'd have to pick a series of books because <laughs> you need the series to get the whole story. <laughs> okay. And then maybe one other book. She's probably going to pick this one, too. And that's the Harry Potter series. No. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just for the pure enjoyment of the story. It's well-crafted, of course, well-written, of course, but it's more about the story and the journey for that. 
But as far as a challenging book that I think I could probably reread over and over again and get something really fascinating out of it is Michael Moorcock's Jerry Cornelius Quartet. It's one of the most experimental things I think I've ever read. Super amazing. I love all of Michael Moorcock, too. This is an impossible question. Yeah, because we, yeah, we, have, well, that's the other thing that we, with this new house that we bought, we actually have this lovely loft that we've turned into a library. Yeah, we do a lot of reading. I mean, for me, I, it's impossible. I, I have to say authors because there's just no way. Neil Gaiman, I mean. Neil Gaiman, Barbara Kingsolver is probably one of my favorite authors of all time. Her books are so well-crafted. She has this beautiful way of writing, but also a beautiful way of weaving this earthiness and, but still kind of feeling spiritual. I'm an atheist, but there's something kind of so unique about the way that she writes that it feels spiritual, but it's like in a very grounded and earthy way because she's so connected to nature. I just love her writing. I'm currently plowing my way through Discworld from Terry Pratchett, which is like a million books. So, and I really enjoy that because I I really love British humor. What else? I don't know. We have so much. Yeah. It's hard to pick. It's like, well, like American Gods, I read recently and loved that, but that's Neil. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to nail down one book particularly when you're a fan of a specific author, you know, like for me, Michael Mark, I've got almost a complete collection of Michael Moorcock novels, which is hard to do. There's still a few out there. I don't have, but he's tops for me. Mm -hmm. Arthur C. Clarke, one of our favorites. Well, anything pretty much science fiction. Yeah. We've got quite a bit of classic science fiction too. We've got a Jules Verne collection and HG Wells and things like that too. We we love as well. Isaac Asimov. Yeah. So it's an impossible question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one's not as hard, but it's still hypothetical. A toy company decides they're going to make an action figure of each one of you. What would be your accessories? <laughs> a record player. <laughs> yeah. A pencil. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe pencil. A drawing pad. <laughs> maybe probably a bottle of tequila. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that was my next question. What is your beverage of choice? Tequila. Okay, that's one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not terribly picky about alcohol. <laughs> um, yeah, red wine, tequila, vodka. I love vodka. <laughs> coffee. We're both coffee. Yeah, me. <laughs> Counterbalance. <laughs> For me, it's coffee. Unfortunately, I can't drink alcohol. I am allergic to it. Really. Horrible things happen when I drink alcohol. Some of the worst experiences is that I'll lose my vision and I'll pass out. And I, that can happen from a single shot. Yes, because uh, we keep experimenting somehow. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and weirdly about it, the way I discovered this is when, you know, when you first turn drinking age, you go out and you party and stuff. And I kept getting ill, but not in that way I just described. I would just get ill. And I realized, oh, I'm getting sick on drinking beer. From that point, I just stuck to hard alcohol. I could keep up with the best of them at that point. And then at one point, I became allergic to hard alcohol. And I couldn't drink that anymore either. I just quit drinking for quite a while. And then after a few years or so, I kept getting cravings for beer. So I tried Sapporo rice beer. I was good on that. I'm like, awesome. And so I ended up trying to move back to hard alcohol. And got into uh, whiskey for a little bit. And then... All of a sudden, it was like the switch flipped. Yeah, it flipped on me again to, like, if I took a shot of something, it would put me on the floor. Yeah, not really figure it out. I don't know if it's a blood sugar thing or some other thing. It might be just something that it just goes in and out for the rest of his life. I don't know. We just, yeah. we just avoid it now for him. Even if I taste the wine that she's having a glass of, even if I take a sip of it, my stomach goes what the hell are you doing? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's bizarre. Have you tried non-alcoholic beer? You might say, why? Why bother? But have you ever tried that? Maybe once in the past. Well, yeah, probably when they first started, they were awful. I enjoy the taste of beer, but at the same time, I kind of feel like, well... You want I, the relaxing effect? I, yeah, I want the, yeah, I want the effect. Gotcha. Yeah, the only one I ever tried that I like the taste of... And it's, you can't compare it to a regular beer, but Caliber is, I think, made by Guinness. It's pretty decent. They're not paying me to say that. I've had that when I've been trying to stay away from alcohol, and I was like, this isn't bad. I, you know, I couldn't deal so much with the other ones because it just tasted too flat. That one actually tastes like a beer. 
but without the effect, if you're trying to avoid the effect. Final question. What question have you never been asked before that you want to be asked? Something you want people to know about you that you haven't been asked yet? You've been asked a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. I really don't. Favorite flavor of ice cream. <laughs> oh, okay. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Rocky Road. Chocolate, nuts, and marshmallows. Well, it has to actually be a marshmallow. Yeah, not <laughs> not that marshmallow squirrel crap. It's got to be real marshmallows. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What about you? Well, for me, with the ice cream, I'm just, you know, nothing too exciting. Just chocolate. I like chocolate, especially with chocolate chips in it. Some kind of chunks in there. Uh-huh. I like the, the texture of both the smooth ice cream and the chocolate chunks. I can agree with that. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to share that you're working on at the moment that you can share? The Echolands project that I'm working on um, that was recently announced for Image Comics. There's not much I can really say about it that we haven't said at the Image Expo already other than that's being worked on. Not sure when it's going to be released yet, but I had to put it down to work on the Where We Live book. I'm in the middle of it drawing issue three, and but I haven't been able to work on it for months. So there's that. Hopefully people are really impressed with it. No, if we're just doing all these different styles, and it's kind of got everything in the kitchen sink in it. All kinds of different art styles in it, all kinds of different types of characters. It's a female-driven adventure story, and hopefully people really dig it. It's a different format. Different format, To It's messing with the page ratios, unusual. It'll end up feeling, hopefully, uh, very panoramic, I guess you could say. Yeah, landscape. It's so, wider than it is tall. Right. So when you're dealing with double-page spreads, like I tend to do most of the time, you end up getting some unusual effects. It has a panoramic feel, or some bits might feel almost mural-like because of the shape rather than anything else. Kind of like the way that it is, you're getting two double page spreads side by side. So you're getting this beautiful length of art. It's been a challenge for him, surprisingly, because he loves doing double page spreads. And so he's like, oh, you know, this is going to be, you know, I'm finally going to get to stretch everything out. But it was actually quite a challenge to design the page yeah, because, for that ratio. Yeah, because, you know, with it being shorter than it is wide, even though you're dealing with the same creative dimensions, the fact that they're arranged differently, I was surprised at how challenging that is to work with the layouts. And uh, the results are fascinating, though, Yeah. so far. I think it's really beautiful work. I'll keep my eyes out for that. And also, Where We Live, coming up on May 30th. I want to thank you both for being on Creator Talks today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. And we really appreciate the support you want to give the project. We really appreciate everyone's support that we've gotten. And hopefully this turns out to be a really good thing. So again, I urge you, please do what you can to help support the project Where We Live, coming out May 30th in comic book stores, June 5th in bookstores like Barnes & Noble. You can order it through your comic book shop. Don't forget that final order cutoff date is April 16th. The diamond order code is MAR. 180600. I will place that in the show notes. Coming up next on Thursday, Porn Sack Pintachote and Aaron Campbell on Infidel. Please join us. Thank you for joining me for Creator Talks this week. The show is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and also on Amazon Echo and Dot Devices. Just say, Alexa, play podcast Creator Talks to hear the latest episode. In addition, you can listen to the show and follow it through Podbean. Your feedback is greatly appreciated, so please rate and review on iTunes if you like the show or an episode that you heard. Your ratings and reviews go a long way to helping the show, and I can't thank you enough for taking a bit of time to do that. For your convenience, in the show notes of each podcast, I have a link to my iTunes page where you can rate and review the show and see the entire list of shows available. If you haven't heard them all, take a look through. There are living legends and -and up-and-coming comic creators. Tell family and friends who like comics and comic book creators about the show. And to subscribe. The content is free. Just as valued are your comments and feedback. You can reach me through Facebook and Twitter at Creator Talks Pod. That's at Creator Talks Pod. You can also reach out to me by email. You can find that at my website, creatortalks.com. At the website, you will also find blog posts, reviews of books that I have read that you might want to read too, my catalog of podcasts, and videos and other written articles on the website, creatortalks.com. A hearty thank you to all my guests. It is an honor and a privilege for you to make time to be on the show and talk to me about your work. It is your knowledge and insight into the creative process that makes the show so unique. My thanks also goes out to my family who makes this show possible. 
especially my executive co-producer, Mrs. Calloway. I'll be back each and every Thursday with a new interview. For Creator Talks, I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. Until next time. <laughs>